Oh, they were recording. Beautiful. Hello, folks. We're here for another exciting dev review. This week is going to be on contract testing. Don't you just love those testing talks? <laughs> so <this laughs> yes, I us, do, Ryan. This leads us um, directly into the question of more testing. Just, just let me code. Just let me code. Um, but I'm going to run right into a demo of saying why contract-driven testing is important. All right, first example. All right, I'm going along. I want to use the off service API. Um, we actually have documentation for the off service. No, no, not going to say where it comes from at this point, but we have documentation for the off service. I go through and, all right, I want to create another user. This is great. Um, this is not interactive API documentation, uh, so I can't run the request directly through um, this, uh, this view. But I can say, all right, beautiful. I've, I've like followed your authorization instructions. I've got Postman handy. I can go in. I can copy this. And I should run this request, and it should just work because it's right of the documentation, right? <laughs> what? what? Why doesn't this work? Oh, I get an error. Strong pass required. But it doesn't say anything about that in ah. It doesn't say anything about that in the documentation. There's nothing related to password requirements or, or validation or anything else. Wow, Ryan, you really fished for a good example. Like what? <laughs> uh, so now, <laughs> um, so now I have to go back into Postman. I have to interpret this request, and I have to say, all right, maybe if I call it test one through three four, and I follow some of their requirements, maybe this will go through. No, it's not authorized, dot, 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 dot. Um, so this is an example of what happens when you have documentation, and that documentation has drifted out of date <clears throat> with the code. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's take a look at another perspective. Um, so I am going to check out um, master. I'm going to get pull this bad boy, and I'm going to install against master on the auth service. Now, when I'm going through the documentation, I notice under all right, under miscellaneous, show health check. Huh, this must be a bug. This is a JSON API, but my documentation is telling me that I'm expecting a content type text HTML with just an OK. There's no JSON here. So I'm going to go ahead and just fix this. OK, I can do that. Um, I can go into my source. I can go into the index file. And I've wow, got to, you learned a lot very quickly. I've got to find this thing. So let's look for where this might be. OK, OK, OK. Send OK, OK. So I, they put, since it's just a simple route, they put it directly here. So I can change that. This is nice and simple. I can now send them some JSON. Let me just call it status, and the status is OK. I made a change to the code, so now I can run my yarn linter, which will be done automatically because we've already done our hooks. I can fix a little linting error. I'm good. Now, I know that I've got unit test on this. So now, all right, I made the fix. Now I have to go into my unit test and fix that. But that shouldn't be that big of a deal. OK, so instead of expecting it to equal OK, I expect it to equal uh, status. Yeah. So I can just run the endpoint and see it. So I can just copy and paste with exactly what the thing will be. It'll look like that. I can go in and <coughs> add that. Great. I can do my testing. <laughs> 
this will take a bit, but now that test should should pass, and I'm I'm, I'm good to go. I'll commit. Great. What's just happened? I forgot about my third step of upsetting the API documentation. So it can happen. the The drift can happen both ways. You can have your API doc. You can you can update your documentation without updating your code, and you can also update your code without updating your documentation. And those are one of the many use cases that a contract driven test would catch uh, immediately. Now that you're convinced that contract driven testing is a great idea. <laughs> uh, it's a fabulous idea. That was horrible. Uh, we can we can dive more into uh, more into what that means. What what is a contract and how we will use contracts for testing in other applications. Um, moving those case studies aside, there are three um, very popular language for writing API contracts. Uh, they are the Open API specification, also known as Swagger, which is the most popular. Um, there's API API Blueprint. Uh, and there's um, RAML. Uh, in terms of like order of operations of which one came out of which, Swagger is the oldest. Uh, RAML came out kind of as an offshoot of Swagger, and then I think API Blueprint is the most recent. But Swagger is definitely the oldest, and then RAML and API Blueprint are a little bit more a little bit more modern. It, uh, for, and for context, uh, Swagger, I think 2011. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, these are what the specifications look like. Just just so when you when you open up one of these files, you'll know roughly what you're getting. Uh, Swagger is going to be JSON. Um, API Blueprint is going to be custom extensions to Markdown, and RAML is going to be uh, in YAML. RAML, yeah. To kind of give you a high level summary of, of kind of the sponsorship, um, Smart Bear was kind of the, the, the biggest company behind Swagger and they contributed it to an organization that's now kind of run by the Linux Foundation. Uh, API Blueprint is backed by Oracle. Uh, there's not a large consortium of companies here. Uh, RAML technically has a RAML working group, but it's backed by Yoko. So when you're looking at these specifications, you're really choosing between smart bear support, Oracle support, and MuleSoft support. Um, I'll note that the the open source ecosystem for Swagger dwarfs that of these other two. Um, the tooling ecosystem on API's API Blueprint is really tight because it's driven by one company. Um, but if you have a tool that is going to do something with API contracts, it almost certainly supports Swagger, whereas it might not support one of these other two specifications. Um, there's also a hole in terms of API gateway support on the other ones. Uh, if, if you want to take the specification and put it into an API gateway like Amazon's API gateway, you can only do that with Swagger. And if so that means you're now into this sort of you have to enter convert. So even though it's, it's really nice to like write your write your like blueprint language. To actually upload that to Amazon, you'd have to convert it, and there's going to be issues with that, et cetera. Just something to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'm familiar with the term API gateway. Uh, yes. So an API gateway, uh, so you have your server for your microservice. Mm -hmm. That service is going to do one thing and one thing well. Yeah. Uh, it's going to take a request. It doesn't care where that request comes in, uh, and it's going to satisfy the request. Yeah. What it doesn't do is control things like rate limiting. Uh, what it doesn't do uh, is look at monetization or, or, or access, like who, like what user can get access to the specific API. Um, unless you're off, you're off. Unless you kind of baked it in, but that's a lot of complexity to push down into a service. So an API gateway handles uh, many of these administrative functions. So you can say, all right, I want to create an API product that's tailored for Grant. Uh, he needs to use uh, five APIs, instead of having to have him as the client interface directly with five APIs, I can, in the API management solution, which is a superset of an API gateway, I can recompose those APIs and say, all right, he needs this endpoint from here, this endpoint from here, this endpoint from here, put those together into an API product, and what he sees is the API product that is tailored for him. 
as well as the rate limiting and the monetization, et cetera, et cetera. Cool. Um, Amazon's API gateway is just an API gateway. It's not an API management solution. These other two, Apogee and Freescale are API management solutions. So Amazon will get you rate limiting, but it won't get you like monetization. Thank you your question. Yeah. Right. The, this talk is focused on contract driven testing, but it's important to note that contracts are useful for driving your entire tooling ecosystem. So once you have this contract, um, be it in Swagger or Apiaries, API Blueprint or RAML, you can take that contract and drive it directly into tool. You can map directly from a contract to an application controller, and I'll talk about that later in one of the gotcha. Uh, you can use the contract to drive your endpoint testing uh, directly without doing much additional work. Um, you can use the contract to make your documentation. So the documentation that I pulled up earlier was the API, API Blueprint documentation for the auth service run through a static documentation generator named Aglio. Um, there's about a dozen of these that you can use to build your documentation. Um, you can use your contract to make your SDK stubs. So if you wanted to make a, so you have your, your RESTful endpoints, you want to make a Python implementation of that or a Go implementation of that so that it's easier, you can run your contract through and it'll stub out the entire thing. Um, uh, you can also use the contract to uh, inform some of your access control. So within the Within the Swagger documentation, you can say which scopes they're going to be allowed. So now you have a link between the scopes that are allowed within the application and the scope from whatever your all services. So there's a lot of power that you get from creating an API contract. Um, I was showing interact. I was showing documentation for Aglio. These are two other very popular tools: Swagger UI, which is specific to Swagger, and Wondershin, which I think will work with more than just Swagger, you can actually run your request from within the GUI really just off of the contract. So you give it a Swagger file and you give it a host and you can run directly without having to go off the post. This is quite useful for people learning to interact with your documentation. Um, this is more of a reference slide specifically for, for Swagger, just the, the litany of tools. We're going to be doing a deep dive into uh, the, the dread testing tool, method. but you could do this. You could do this same presentation or similar presentation on any one of these areas of where you use a contract to drive a tool, and therefore, answer work. Um, so within API testing, um, you can boil this down to like contract testing versus behavioral testing. Um, or I guess you could call it a functional test, but let's put that aside. Within a contract driven test, you'll say, I have some number of endpoints. Those endpoints have some number of verbs with them. And I'm going to go through and I'm going to test just the happy path for each of those verbs. And then I'm going to go through and test error states of each of those verbs in isolation. Um, when you're doing a contract test, you will generally do your setup and tear down as a part of the test. So if I have an endpoint that says list all users, before that test starts, I will populate the database with a user that I can actually see. And after that test ends, I'll have an empty database again. That's a contract driven test. You test just what the contract says and just that each endpoint in isolation will behave as expected. In a behavioral test, or a, some people will call this a scenario test, you test um, common application flows that a, that a user would make. So for example, a behavioral test might be, and I'll show an example of this later. Um, log in, create a user, create a user in batch if that's something that your API allows. See that you can get all the users, delete your users, and so you chain them together so that you see a workflow works. The reason that both of them are kind of necessary is it's possible that each individual element will work, but you'll have some sort of bug or edge case where the chaining won't work. This talk in Dread is going to focus specifically on the contract-based testing. Dread is um, 
is, is not really designed to do behavior driven testing and chain things together. You can, but it's not really what it's designed for. And within contract driven testing, we're going to focus specifically on the uh, producer or the provider side of the testing. Um, there are other applications out there, PACT being uh, one of them that advocates doing the testing from the other side. Um, and you'll see what I mean by that later. But with respect to the provider side testing, you write an expected request, send it to a provider, either a mock or a real service, and get an actual response back. You then compare that actual response with your expectations around the response, and if it's good, it's good. Uh, cool. Now we're going to go back to a demo. Uh, I am going to put in, ignore the gotchas for the time being, we'll, we'll get to those. Uh, I'm going to um, take our uh, API document here. And I'm going to do contract driven testing off of this with uh, probably two of the endpoints in Dread live. So you can see how easy it is. Um, let's start out with the easiest possible endpoint, which is going to be this uh, health check endpoint. I can install. Dread, I'm just going to use the global install version because it's easier. But if you were doing this in a project, you would install it into you could install it into the dev dependencies. I'm going to say, let's go to Apiary and let's go to localhost 4000 uh, slash API. All of the tests fail. No surprise. Now I'm going to take one of these. Why would it be surprised to test fail? Because the because the, the the documentation is out of date with the API. All of it. Got it. I see. I I used a, like a trivial example with the password thing to demonstrate it, but all of the all of them are out of date. So when you ran that command, what did Dread actually do? Okay, so what Dread did. So within your API file, it's marked down and it's nested. You list the collection of users, which refers to the user endpoint. That user endpoint will implement multiple verbs. <laughs> For each of those verbs, you have uh, one or more request and response pairs. So for example, if I want to uh, list all users, I would get users. If I wanted to create a new user, I would post users. Dread goes through and says, okay, for the user endpoint, take this request, send it to uh, the server that's running, which I specified in the command line. So using this API file, send to this address for each of the tightly coupled requests and response pairs. It sends this request, it gets the response back, and then compares that response to the expected response. Um, and it, it has a underlying dread. There's a library called Gavel, uh, which actually does the comparison. Um, and it, it's not just like a, a shallow comparison or deep comparison. It's, 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 it's fancy. They're automatically, <laughs> <laughs> um, they, they, will, they, they have a bunch of rules about um, how the comparisons are made. They will automatically strip any headers that are not important for content negotiation. So you don't have to declare all your random headers. Um, they will automatically um, detect or, or um, make sure that the schema that you have in your response is actually the schema that comes back. So for example, here, I'm putting out a specific example, but Gavel behind the scenes is saying, I don't actually care that it's 19 and test one, two, three and test. What I care about is that this is a, a numeric, this is a string and that these are the key things. So Dread, so, so Dread via Gavel will do the comparisons on the schema, um, and it'll infer it from the body. You can also, this is just kind of an aside, you can also uh, list out explicit um, attributes in addition. So you could say, all right, um, I want to have an ID, an example for that ID is 19, 
and that's going to be a number, and this is, you know, the index. And you can have both the attributes listed out as well as the body. Uh, you can also create a data type section within APR, so you can actually name an attribute and reuse it throughout the API. So there's a lot of power here, and so making attributes and such is a function of API's blueprint spec. You can do the same thing in Swagger. It's called um, the, 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 the Swagger's um, like OSI schema, which is related to JSON schema. Um, but the comparison, the power of the comparison is, is from Gamble. Does that answer your question? Um, now, so I can work with the health check in isolation, I'm just going to copy it out. Um, you can use the um, the dread command line tool to say only run one section, um, but I'm just going to copy it out for convenience. Cool. Red command line tool. Yes. We're going to. Uh, <laughs> no, but, but but the schema enforcement tool is called Gavel, so they, they have some humor. So I'm not writing attribute, I'm just writing this thing directly. And actually, JSON. I don't need a character encoder. <laughs> and then go back to thread. I can run this help check that A pin. And it fails. Because I actually did need the content type. And there you go, the test pass. And if you want to see the comparison anyway, there's a command line tool for it. So all I've had to do now is just write a request that I could actually send. Yeah. and write an example response that I could actually receive. And it tested automatically. So just by documenting my API, I can contract test um, each of my unauthenticated endpoints. Just like that. Ooh. Uh, how did you decide of all the missing headers but the one that you really cared about with the content type one? Because like, the difference there is... Uh, because it's important for negotiation. So I know that Gavel is going to ignore most of these because they're not important for negotiation. Um, it's not going to, like it's not going to care about an e tag or a date because those are things that are highly variable. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Um, mm -hmm. Things are related. To oh, um, so some APIs can be tricky. Um, so our APIs are pretty simple. They're JSON APIs. <laughs> so you send JSON and receive JSON. Yeah. It doesn't have to be that way. Um, you can have like content type negotiation as a part of the API yeah. so that your API will actually respond differently based on whether you set the content type as XML versus JSON. Mm -hmm. um, so it's important for content negotiation. And you could actually, you can, you can, you can include multiple examples. So if I had an API that responded to both XML and JSON um, based on the content type, I can make one request as JSON and one request as XML, and then and then write the response objects as XML and JSON. So here we don't have to deal with that, but that that's why the content type and specifically the character that the character encoding could be useful. You can also do the same thing with characters. Um, like if you had a foreign language support or something, you could you could specify I'm going to use the full Unicode set so I can send back Korean. So what's the benefit or what are the advantages around using APR with manually generated contract code versus using the annotation to auto generate your open API set? Uh, yeah, one more time. 
uh, with Express, you have the Express Dash Open API module, where if you use annotations, you can auto generate uh, your Open API spec, which is what Swagger uses in the mm -hmm. background, to generate the documentation itself. And then theoretically, as long as you keep your annotations in sync, it simplifies. So my question is, what's the benefit to a manual contract structure that you then implement against versus auto-generating the contract? I, I hear you. Do you want to jump straight to the uh, binding contract to controller section at the end of the talk? Uh, no, I have a question. Oh, okay. I can wait. Um, <laughs> Um, I thought it was legitimate. It, it, no, it, no it, it is. That's, that's why it's here. All right, I'll the just, question I'll just, is not real. I'll just, I'll just skip ahead. Um, go, through, go through it by the plan. Oh, I'll get there. I'm patient. I know Grant also has a question about that demo. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so it's one of the endpoints. You kind of mentioned it before. I don't quite get it. Um, if one of the endpoints is list users. Mm -hmm. And there aren't any users in the database or whatever. How does thread test that? Because if thread gets gets that endpoint and there aren't any users, how it will get an empty list. That is correct. It. Um the short answer to this Can is, I jump in? Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yep. Uh, I was just wondering if Grant could repeat the question because he asked awesome questions, but I couldn't hear him. Yeah, sorry. I was far away from the phone. Um, the question was for essentially for endpoints that rely on the state of the database, how does Dread do any setup necessary? And my example was if there's an endpoint that is get a list of users, um, then but the database is empty, then Dread will hit that endpoint and get an empty list back, and that's kind of a worthless test. Mm -hmm. um, Got it. And the the, the short answer is um, Dread implements hooks. Okay. So just like you have lifecycle hooks in Git, Dread also has lifecycle hooks. Okay. Um, so within the order of precedence of lifecycle hooks, you have before all set up, before every, mm -hmm. before specific, before validation, that is each request and response pair the actual test execution, and then after validation, after um, after each, after all. Sure. So the canonical way of, uh, of doing your creation and deletion is to do it with the hooks. Um, for the, for auth, which I'll show you an example of, um, you would do that in the um, before all to get the token and then before each to send the token. Uh, for populating the database for a specific user, then you would do that in the before for that specific one. Sure. Uh, and to show you an example of what that looks like, um, I wrote the example for auth because I couldn't find one online. Um, Apiary wrote a Dread example uh, in JavaScript to demonstrate the usage of before hooks. Uh, we'll, we'll go through this. This I'll go through this for authentication, but just so I can answer your question. Yeah. Yeah. This good. is what you would write. Okay. So you can actually write a JavaScript file yeah. and just do it. Um, it. So this is on the gotchas. Um, we heart Java. Dread does not support hooks for Java. It's been an open ticket for the past three years. <laughs> um, most of the other. <laughs> Most of the other major languages are supported. Um, Dread supports the JavaScript hooks natively. Um, they've done bindings, I think, by a C++ uh, for the other languages. They have Go, they have Python, et cetera. So you're going to be writing your hooks in, most likely, the language that your application is running in. You don't have to, though. You, you, could, you could be testing a, since this is going by the contract, you could be testing a Spring application and write your hooks in JavaScript, but you probably wouldn't want to do that. Cool. Yeah, that's because you'd probably use like Swagger, or Karate, or maybe Hippie. Uh, so he mentioned Karate. Karate is going to be one of those behavioral tools. You can use it for contract testing, but when I think of it, I think of it as a behavioral tool. And to be anal, specifically for Spring, they actually have a contract testing library that's internal to Spring. 
Cool. Um, so writing a hook is pretty cool. Um, I'm just going to check out <coughs> the completed example and walk you through it, because that's easier for me. Yeah. Woo. Cool. Um, to run a hook with dread, we'll be using the same command hook files. Hook.js. That's it. Now you actually have to write your hook file. The hook file that uh, API provides in their example doesn't do anything about um, the authentication and setting your token. So that's the example that I decided to write. Um, in API's documentation, they actually say, the people ask the question like, oh, how do you deal with like authorization? And they say, you can do it with hooks. And I, I Googled for about a half an hour. I couldn't find an <laughs> example of them doing it. Um, also known as uh, QED or left as an exercise to the reader. Uh, but it's pretty straightforward. Well, thank you for a good example. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we have the hooks. We have a before all hook, which is going to say, OK, from the transaction, let's assemble the URL. Um, let's do a request that posts the username and password. You, you could set these from environment variables from the config file. I just hard coded them here. Uh, for convenience, set the token, and then before each transaction, use the token. Um, as an and we can do this versus that health check APIB, even though the health check doesn't require um, the authentication, we can just see it actually run. So this is the health check thing that we saw before. No authentication required. And we're going to run it with the hook file. It passes. This is the token. Um, you might be looking at this and say, like, why did I do this? Um, this, in my opinion, this is a, a slight failing of the um, API for Dread. Within their transaction object, they don't actually, within the transaction object, they don't actually just give you the URL that they're going to be calling. They give you all the constituent components, um, which is a little bit annoying. So within that transaction object, they'll independently um, there's one element in the array for each test. And for each of those elements, they'll independently give you the host, the port, uh, and the path. <clears throat> they don't give it to you all assembled. The other slight failing for the, bef uh, for the before all hook is they don't give you the host name that you passed in directly. Like this is, this is my base, this is my, 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 my base host and route. It would be nice if I had that as an object of just like, this is the base and you can use the base, but they don't give that. So what I had to do is say, all right, give me the first request response pair, reassemble the base URL from that, and then hit the authorization no point. Is there a reason why they do it that way? Um, it means, it goes into the API design. So what they're doing is they're returning an array. Um, Generally speaking, when you return an array, you want each of the objects in the array to be identical. You don't want you don't want zero to be some sort of special number from all the rest. Right, right. So if they were to do what I'm proposing, which is to have general information, what they would have had to do is had an object as their outermost uh -huh. scope, had like generic info and probably a meta hash, and then a um, request response pairs hash, would in, which would include this array. Uh, it means that the request response pairs, which is what most people care about, is one level deeper in nesting, and you need a specific key to get to it. Um, so they decided to just do it this way. 
it's 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 fine. It's, it's just a little bit annoying for this for this use case. Um, it also means that um, the transaction and transactions objects are they're tightly related. So this isn't really transaction; it's transactions because it's an array. This just refers to one element of the array. So if I wanted to do operations on the array, I could very easily do it between transactions here and transaction, which is another benefit of just giving it a straight array. Where was I? Cool. So um, we're now setting a token, and we've done this against the, the health check endpoint. But the health check endpoint doesn't actually require um, authorization. So now let us create a, let us take the, um, the API by APIB file for another endpoint that does require authorization. We have our hooks written, and now we can actually run it for realsies. Um, I wrote an example for listing users, but I'll just go through and, and, and create it and have this as a backup just in case I should fail. So we can excerpt the listing of users. I don't need the group miscellaneous. I do need the group users. I don't need authorization. Um, this is this is another kind of gotcha of, with respect to tester. Uh, what some people do is they declare a like a test token and they hard and they have a hard coded test token, so that means you don't have to do this navigation with the hooks. Um, other people just don't have the the header included and prepend it from a variable like I'm doing here. So how is it a good idea to hard code it? It seems to me it would be a bad idea in general. Uh, it's quicker. It's, it's it's your it's your it's your poor man's route because then you don't have to write the hooks well. Um, okay. Uh, so if you want to do things, the, the 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 I'd say it's more appropriate to <laughs> write the hooks uh, or otherwise do your negotiation to get your tokens and then pass in the tokens at runtime. Um, but you should still say that a token needs to exist in the documentation, right? Yeah. So okay. in that case, what you would do is something like this. And this will this will read just fine. It'll be it'll reset. Dread will understand what that means. Yeah. <clears throat> cool. So now I should be able to run this. Um, one other aside that's specific to our APIs. Um, I didn't actually notice this at the time, um, but we apply our API versioning into the URL of the microservice, which is something we probably shouldn't be doing. Um, you can use um, versions in the in, you can use versions in the URL, um, but generally you'd be doing this at your proxy or API gateway or whatever, and not in the service itself, because it means that. Interesting. That runs counter to what I have read. I have read when you have an API and you're structuring your API, you should version your API where the API breaks backwards compatibility. Yes, and that versioning is done in the contract version. So within the contract, you'll have a version. And in the contract version, you can keep in sync with the version for but the- But if you're having a deployment that has a V1, V2 of the same endpoint. Gotcha. So what I would propose is they would be on, they would be separate releases. So you'd have a release that was your, you know, your, your V1 branch, and you'd have a uh, API documentation, which is your V1 API. And then you'd have another branch, which is your V2 and your- um, Okay. The you could you can do it either way. I, 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 I'm not going to debate this over right now. Although I guarantee you, I'm going to do research because <laughs> what you're saying is counter to what I've what I 
have an understanding of, and I very well might be wrong, but it, it does run counter to how I've been heard of describing version API endpoints. Uh, not worried about it either way, but I do want to know the answer. I don't think we'll get there today. So, okay. um, the reason that this is a problem for this particular API uh, is because the API version label is supplied inconsistently. So the health check API is against API, whereas most of the other things are against V2. And there's no V1 included. You just take the version out of the package.json. So you kind of get the worst of both worlds doing it this way. All right, we will run. And it passes. Yay. Simple, right? So simple. We can do the same thing for like a create endpoint. Same situation. We can go. Into the API documentation. Copy out the appropriate. copy out the appropriate endpoint. This one will fail because, like I mentioned, the API documentation is out of date. Don't need this. We still need the users. We don't need the get request. And square bracket on the scopes. And square bracket on this. You had scopes listed, but I didn't see an end. You're correct. Um, yep, so we've got user, we've got post. As Jonah mentioned, the documentation should include that request header. The request body. Uh, as an aside, the reason you need this space here is because in Markdown, you need the, um, the space to know that this is a, a block quote. So it sends the entire thing over. It'll, it, it'll still be smart enough to do it, but it'll throw a warning if you don't put the space in. JSON UTF, expect JSON. Cool. We can now run dread specifically against the create user. And it fails because of that password error that I showed you at the very beginning. So now you can update your API documentation. And it will pass. So if you were doing this for the entire API file, um, you can pull out the individual chunks because it might be easier, or you can use the um, the, the command line selection tool. So to do that, you want to list the names in the file, which is this. So if I wanted to do this versus the entire API file, 
would run it with the names and it'll give me an info grouping for, for each one. And I can just pick which one I want to run. So for example, if I want to run just the health check, I can do something like that and it will only run, it'll skip all the tests and only run the health check. It's a, it's a very powerful tool. Uh, okay, so going back to some gotchas, I mentioned that uh, Dread doesn't support Java. Um, I also mentioned that Dread is good for doing the individual contract test, not doing the behavioral testing. You can work around it kind of with a built-in that they have called Sorted which will run all of your creation operations before your get operations and then all your delete operations afterwards. Um, basically, it'll take your API documentation and your API documentation is generally listed by collection. So you'll have user and all the verbs and it'll run all the post input first. Uh, it's a very quick and dirty way of getting to um, behavioral like testing with very little additional work. Um, but particularly for a complex interaction scenario, you're still gonna to wanna to write a behavioral test. Um, this next one, the request and response objects are uh, very, they're, they're, they're tightly coupled. You use, the res you use the response to, you use the expected response to validate the actual response. For each verb, you can create multiple request and response pairs, but you can't, right now, Dread doesn't really support uh, putting in multiple um, responses for one request. Um, I'll leave it there. So now that we've done a deep dive on um, specifically producer side contractor and testing of Dread, I'm going to zoom out and talk. I'm not going to show demos. I'm going to just talk very briefly about uh, consumer side testing, which is a subset of contract testing and the behavioral testing. So everything that you just saw was on the producer side of this diagram. You have an expected risk. You have an expected request. You send it against a real provider or a mockable provider. Get the actual response and compare the actual response. Which you keep. Which you can do is start on the other side. Within your unit test, you can write the minimally expected response for that unit test. So you send an actual request and reply from um, either a mock or a stub with a minimally expected response. The innovation of a tool like PACT is that it records all of your actual requests. So within your unit testing, you put in PAC to record the actual request with your expected responses. Then you take that PAC file with your actual request and run it against your provider. So instead of writing uh, expected request, you actually use the real request from the application. And the idea behind this is that, say you're a large API provider, you're gonna have the producer side testing you can then have like um, your consumer side packs just available so that I, as the producer, can have a list of actual requests from hundreds of real applications that I can actually run against my producer to make sure I'm not violating those contracts. Uh, it, <laughs> would not consumer side testing as described here. I Conventionally, the way I think of it, that's most often used, or I've seen most often used, when you have service, service communication. A service has to be able to test its communication to another service, and by that definition, that would be consumer-side testing, because a service consuming another microservice is the consumer, and it still needs to test that interaction. Uh, yes, I, I would say that the, the distinction is where do the tests reside? So on the consumer-side testing, the tests reside within the consumer application. Yeah. On the producer-side testing, the tests reside within the producer application. Yeah. Um, and you link them both together through this pack file or some recording of the actual request. Mm -hmm. okay. Does that answer your question? Uh, it wasn't a question, it was more an observation. Where a service or a function actually reaches out to another 
system or contract, mm -hmm. you would need both. You would need a provider side test to test your endpoints, and you would need a consumer side test to be able to test the validity of the communication to another contractor endpoint. It's more my statement. Uh, my question. Yes. Um, which you, a variation that, that uh, you'll find uh, Postman advocates this philosophy and APR also advocates this philosophy is just to use a mock. So you don't actually, um, you don't actually go out and record the request. You just say the consumer is going to hit a mock, which is getting the responses from the provider's API documentation. Yes, but uh, not counting, uh, I would point out the middle word in packed mock provider is a mock. <laughs> Whether the mock is map packed or not is immaterial. The factor is you, it, the fact that's important is consumer driven testing and the use of mocks to drive that. Um, I mean, packed is nothing more than a recording system, similar to, oh, you can do it in uh, not just a uh, gesture. You mean jest? Jest, pardon me. Uh, I'm not sure. Yes. Okay. I, I, not either. So. But we I've just started long enough. Let's move on. Um, I mentioned behavioral testing like karate. This is what that looks like. You'll have a scenario. I use the create user, view user, delete user, and then you'll run through it as such. Um, you this is where you start getting into the debate. So some people will say, if you're going to do consumer side testing, you don't actually need behavioral testing because you have the actual responses that your consumer is doing in real time. Other people will say, well, you don't really need the consumer side testing when I can do my behavioral test within the producer that shows the expected workflows that I'll support. And some people will say, oh, you just need both. Um, You've got peanut butter in my chocolate, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's that. I don't want a Reese's. Um, no. <laughs> We're going to go back to Mike's earlier question, uh, which was around um, binding an API contract to a controller. Uh, or the reverse of that is having controllers that define the API contract. There are two parts of the same problem. Uh, so Swagger has a, a piece of middleware called Swagger Node where it will automatically crawl the operation IDs within the Swagger document. Uh, and all you have to do is implement the, the, the stuff. You don't have to write routes at all. There are no routes that are not directly tied to um, the Swagger documentation. What he's talking about is something that I've seen, what I was going through, I saw it, it, was, a, it was like a Java thing, where they put like decorators above their controllers that wrote the specification, they compile the specification from the code. Because I have to be anal, it's supported in Python, Java, Ruby, JavaScript. Which tool is this? Uh, JavaScript specifically, Open API, ex or Express Open API in a module. For Python, Open API Pi. For Ruby, I don't know. For Java's, well, shit, there are dozens of them. But Swagger has them officially supported within the Swagger structure. The only ones I've directly used are the Python node and JavaScript. So this is a thing you can do. Yeah. <laughs> and you can do it either from writing the contract to the controller or from within the document or from within your code itself. I'm okay. well my question is what's the balance against I mean it was a question, not a trick. I mean, there is an advantage if you use annotations and driven to generate your Swagger docs because at that stage it's never out of sync. Mm -hmm. The count counterpoint is if you write your Swagger docs correctly and it's in the intended contract, then you should be writing your code to match. But it's there's obviously the sync issue there. So there's the balance between the two. And I was interested in the opinion on the subject of that balance. Um, my opinion is going to be follow your like API philosophy. So um, a place like Apiary uh, is going to do, they're going to lean towards a top-down API design. So you write your, your contract first. And as you're writing your contract, you're, you're using it against a real mock that's driven by your API documentation. And once you have a pretty good feel of what the system boundaries are and what your individual collections are, 
and you have a mock that you can actually write a real application against to use that, then you would actually implement your API. Um, so this, if you take this approach, you cannot do the writing your code with the annotations approach. You have to write your documentation um, up front, usually with the help of a editor. You, you can then do the binding to the controllers, or you can write your routes up independently. The other philosophy is going to say, we don't really know what our API design should be, so we're just going to we're just going to build our API. Um, and I would say that like Postman's design philosophy uh, supports us a little bit more. So you just write your API, you do a request against the API, and you see a response. You put that into a Postman collection, and that becomes your contract. And in that case, you can use uh, this approach where you put in the decorators on your controllers. Um, long story short, um, but like um, the design first philosophy works well when you write your contract first, and they we're gonna just feel this out approach works well with the decorators, or if you call them a more bottom up approach. Um, I have personally used this uh, Swagger Note tool. It's what uh, I implemented all of our services at, at the, my previous company. Uh, and I really liked it because it meant that it was impossible for our routes to drift out of sync. Uh, that's my time. <laughs> Any other questions? You timed it perfectly.